The name Preston Tucker may not be familiar to you, but in the 1940s, he was the Elon Musk of his time. His Tucker torpedo was the car of the future, and he promised multiple advances in technology and pioneered new safety features that no other car company had. It should have been one of the most popular cars on the market. It should have paved the way for the cars of the future, but in reality, it failed. Whether it was due to shadowy forces working against him, such as competing car companies and even the government, or whether he was simply in over his head, the Tucker failure has been debated for years. But the fact remains that even though he went bankrupt after only producing 50 cars, those cars are some of the most valuable cars on the planet today. The last remaining Tucker vehicles are so rare that when one goes up for sale, it can bring in well over $3 million. So how did this mechanic create such a stir and cause such a scandal, the likes of which the automobile industry has never seen? This is the true story of how one man's dream nearly disrupted the entire automobile industry. Preston Tucker was born in 1903 on a farm in Michigan. He grew up in a suburb outside of Detroit, which of course is the home of the big three car manufacturers, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. Even from an early age, it was clear Tucker would grow up to be a gearhead. He learned how to drive when he was just 11, and he became obsessed with cars his entire life. When Tucker turned 16, he began buying used cars to fix up and resell for a profit. He dropped out of high school and began working as a police officer just so he could drive around in a police cruiser, but he was kicked out of the police force twice. The first time he joined, he was pulled out by his mother because he was under the legal age requirement. But when he was old enough, he became a police officer again. One winter, it got so cold in the car that he used a blowtorch to cut a hole into the dashboard to let the heat from the engine in, and he was fired for modifying his police cruiser. At 20 years old, he got married to his wife, Vera, and they briefly ran a gas station together while Preston worked on the Ford assembly line. Throughout the rest of his 20s, he landed various car salesman gigs, working for Studebaker, Chrysler, and Dodge dealerships. Nothing in his life suggested that he would one day rattle the entire industry with his vision for the next generation of automobile. In his spare time, Tucker was also modifying race cars and participating in the Indianapolis 500, Tucker partnered with a famous engine builder named Henry Miller, and together they worked for 10 years designing race cars. In 1935, they formed a company, Miller Tucker, and they convinced Henry Ford to fund the creation of 10 race cars, specifically designed for the Indy 500. It was a massive opportunity that turned massively bad. They only had a few months to complete the vehicles, and because there wasn't enough time and money to correctly complete the cars, it failed spectacularly. Henry Ford was so embarrassed by the performance of the cars that he ordered them to be destroyed. Incidentally, a few of the race cars do still exist in museums today. But even though this was a major failure, Preston Tucker still held on to the dream of making amazing cars. In 1937, he moved his family to Ypsilanti, Michigan to a large house with a barn on the property. He turned the barn into a mechanics workshop and called it the Ypsilanti Machine and Tool Company. During World War II, the big three car companies were ordered to stop manufacturing civilian vehicles to help out with the war effort instead. There were Chrysler tanks, Buick airplane engines, and Ford B-24 bombers. And Preston Tucker also wanted to use his skills to contribute to the war effort. He submitted his prototype for a vehicle he called the Tucker Tiger. It was an armored car that could go up to 114 miles an hour. The U.S. military felt that the Tiger was too fast and instead went with a tank called the M-24 Chassis that traveled just 35 miles an hour. In 1940, he launched the Tucker Aviation Corporation and submitted designs for a fighter called the Tucker XP-57. But again, the aircraft was never built. And after all these failed attempts, you would have thought that Tucker would have given up and gone back to the assembly line, but he didn't. He didn't because he found an opportunity to take just one more chance. Since the big three were so preoccupied building weapons during the war, they hadn't made any new car models since 1941. And once they were allowed to manufacture cars again in 1946, they were essentially just copies of old models they had released before the war. They simply didn't have time to test any new improvements on their vehicles. And this gave Preston Tucker an idea. With soldiers returning home from Europe, people wanted to live the American dream. An entire generation of people was eager to buy a car, a house, and start a family. This was a once-in-a-lifetime moment where there was a high demand for cars and a gap in production of innovative vehicles from the big three. Preston Tucker seized on this moment as the perfect opportunity to present a new car design that could disrupt the entire American automobile industry. 
In 1944, Preston Tucker began designing ideas for his car, called the Tucker Torpedo. Some people were put off by the word torpedo because of the war, so he also called it the Tucker 48. Tucker had taken a lifetime of working on cars to propose improvements on all the problems he had identified with the cars of the day. At the time, most car companies were only concerned with improving the speed and horsepower of cars every year. Tucker was the first and the only car company that advertised the need for a safe vehicle for your family. But he also had so much experience racing in the Indy 500 that he also knew how to make a powerful car that would satisfy a customer's need for safety and speed. The original design for the Tucker Torpedo had a rear engine, four-wheel independent suspension, disc brakes, fuel injection, torque converters, and a new engine design. It also included a third center headlight called the Cyclops Eye that moved when you turned the steering wheel. Tucker also pioneered the industry with new safety features like seat belts, a roll bar, a padded dashboard, side impact protection, and a windshield made with pop-out safety glass. This was far ahead of its time and would go on to become the standard of car in the future, but at the time, other car companies were more concerned with selling fast, powerful cars rather than safe ones. And Tucker's ideas and designs were too advanced for the big three to ever seriously consider copying. Also, in addition to being great with cars, Tucker also knew how to get people excited about them. Tucker created an ad in Science Illustrated magazine about his car before it had even gone into production. This included an illustration of the concept vehicle, as well as a short article about the various features it was expected to have. After the article was published, the response from the public was incredible. People wanted them. Tucker realized he struck gold and began receiving hundreds of thousands of letters in the mail from customers who wanted to buy the car. But there was just one problem. He had committed to one year to deliver the vehicles, and he had yet to even build the first car. Tucker used his momentum to raise money from 50,000 stockholders during an initial public offering and raised $25 million. He was also able to convince 1,800 dealerships to agree to sell Tucker vehicles across the United States. Tucker was even selling branded accessories like radios and luggage before the vehicle was ever made. Nowadays, it may not seem odd, as most people today are familiar with crowdfunding campaigns on places like Kickstarter, where many people invest in good ideas before the final product is complete. But in the 1940s, this concept was very unusual, and it caused a lot of people to be suspicious of Tucker, his company, and his motivations. But once Tucker got his financial backing from investors, he was able to secure a $15 million government contract to rent the largest warehouse in the world, the Dodge Chicago Aircraft Engine Plant, which was a whopping 475 acres. That's nearly an entire square mile. He hired 1,900 employees, and they began working on building the Tucker cars. The clock was ticking, and they were running out of time to build the first prototype car to reveal to the public. So instead of using the new engine design concept, they went with an existing helicopter engine. Tucker bought the entire Franklin Aircraft Engine Company just to make sure he had enough available to put into his cars. His idea was that if a customer came into a Tucker dealership for repairs, mechanics could quickly swap in a brand new engine. While Preston Tucker was great with engines, he was not an engineer. So he didn't understand how difficult all his wish list items were to put into a new car. He also received a lot of pushback from the board of executives, who all had much more experience in the automotive industry. Many of the features on his wish list wouldn't make it into the final car design. There simply wasn't enough time or money to cram all his innovations into one vehicle. Even so, he still created one of the most technologically advanced cars of the 1940s. June 19th, 1947. When the day had finally come to showcase his new car to the public, the audience was anxiously waiting as the employees scrambled to prepare backstage. Finally, a curtain lifted, revealing the car on a rotating stage. Tucker's daughter Marilyn launched the new car by smashing a bottle of champagne against the bumper, but that's when the party ends. The car still had several problems, like the fact that it couldn't go in reverse. The suspension arms broke, and the radiator boiled over. Tucker instructed the band to play very loudly to cover up the sounds of the roaring engine. A journalist named Drew Pearson was present for the event and wrote that Tucker's car was a fraud made up from parts he found in a junkyard. 
Though the issues with the prototype were quickly fixed before the car went into full production, it was already too late, and the negative reviews ruined Tucker's reputation. Also, it didn't help that he went back on his original promise of selling cars for just $1,000. Tucker truly underestimated the cost of materials, so the price had increased by 400% to $4,000. It was seen as a real bait and switch, disappointing a lot of people and angering others. Tucker had set out to make an affordable vehicle and ended up with one of the most expensive expensive cars on the market. It was the price of a high-end luxury vehicle without the luxury brand name attached. But Tucker was still determined to succeed. To prove his critics wrong, he developed seven more vehicles and ran an endurance test at the Indianapolis 500 Speedway. During the test, one of the Tucker torpedoes crashed and rolled, going 95 miles an hour. Miraculously, all of the safety features worked. The driver walked away with just a bruise on his elbow, and the car was still drivable afterwards. The aftermath of that accident was recorded on film, which proved to everybody that he truly was making the safest car in America. However, as much as the public was marveling at the new innovations of the Tucker torpedo, they weren't the only ones keeping a watchful eye on the project. Also watching was the big three, and they were not liking the advancements they were seeing. It seemed like the Tucker Corporation was on its way to disrupting the big three automakers. In fact, many say that Tucker made the car too good. Allegedly, the Big Three felt threatened by Tucker, and they were afraid that his car would put them out of business, so they did everything in their power to make sure his company was destroyed. The trouble started when the Tucker Corporation tried acquiring a crucial supply of steel. Major car manufacturers told the suppliers not to sell to Tucker unless they charged him double. Because of this, Tucker put in bids for two different steel mills so that he could afford the cost of materials. Michigan Senator Homer Ferguson was the head of the War Assets Administration. He rejected Tucker's bids on the steel mills, which put a major halt in production. Michigan is home of Detroit, the biggest car manufacturing city in the country, so it would make sense that he would be on the side of the companies that funded his campaign. Homer Ferguson needed the backing of the Big Three in order to be re-elected, so it would be in his best interest to reject helping a competing car company in Chicago. To make matters worse, the SEC became suspicious of the Tucker Corporation, ultimately serving them with a lawsuit. With 31 felony indictments for mail fraud, conspiracy to defraud, and other various violations, the SEC claimed the Tucker Corporation had taken in money with no real intent to make and deliver the vehicles. The SEC seized all of the Tucker Corporation's documents and ordered that the factory be shut down until the investigation was complete. At the time the factory was shut down, only 37 cars had been completed, but 300 of his most loyal employees returned to finish the remaining 13 cars without pay. Tucker responded to the SEC's allegations by writing an open letter to the automobile industry, which was published in multiple newspapers across the United States. In this letter, Tucker accused the Big Three and members of the U.S. government that they had sent spies to his factory. Even though Tucker laid out the conspiracy theory that these powerful corporations were trying to ruin his business, it didn't keep him from being dragged into court. In 1940, in 1949, Preston Tucker and six other executives were brought to trial. If he had been found guilty, he could have been sentenced to jail for several years. Tucker's defense attorneys countered every one of the SEC's claims with solid facts and evidence, and when it was time to state a defense, they declined, trusting that the jury would use their own logic and reasoning to see that they were innocent. And it worked. On January 22, 1950, the jury found Preston Tucker and the other executives not guilty. When the trial was over, he invited the jurors outside to see the Tucker 48 for themselves. He had one parked outside the courtroom, proving that his car wasn't a fraud after all. In a lot of ways, he had been vindicated, but it was already too late. Unfortunately, the trial was excruciatingly long and completely ruined their chances of recovery. The company was now in a massive amount of debt, and it had received an onslaught of negative press during the entire trial. Preston Tucker may have avoided a jail sentence, but it was too late to revive the Tucker Corporation. They were forced into bankruptcy, and all all of the Tucker Corporation assets were sold at auction in Chicago. One man's dream was officially crushed, and the Big Three had less competition to worry about. 
When the trial was over, Tucker was still surprisingly optimistic about the future. He was quoted saying, Even Henry Ford failed the first time out. Preston Tucker moved back to his home in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Even after the public humiliation of losing his company, he did not give up. He tried to create a new car company called the Carioca. The president of Brazil approached him with the opportunity to build a new car plant in South America, which he was seriously considering. In 1955, a magazine published a story about the new car with a quote from him saying, I never gave up, I never will. But all of these plans came to an end when he was diagnosed with lung cancer. Preston Tucker died in 1956 at just 53 years of age. Now, Tucker cars are a distant memory, and most people have never heard of the company. Only 47 Tucker torpedoes still exist in museums today and in homes of private collectors. They were so well made that even today, many of the cars are still running. When one goes up for sale, it can bring in well over $3 million. What do you think? Was a government conspiracy truly responsible for ruining the Tucker Corporation? Or was Preston Tucker a dreamer who was truly in over his head? And speaking of overambitious dreamers, if you don't know the story of car designer John DeLorean, who also created a car in his name, only to have his dreams destroyed, then click on this video right here. Thanks for watching, and please be sure to turn on the notification bell icon so you don't miss any more of my future videos. And with that, I'll see you in the next one.